Hello and welcome. We're just waiting a few minutes for everybody to load into the lobby and we'll be starting in just a few minutes. Hello and welcome. We're just waiting for a few minutes for our lobby to, for those that are in the lobby to join in. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. We will be starting momentarily. We're just waiting for people to load in out of the lobby. Thank you for your patience. All right. Hello and welcome to Fireman's Hall Museum's membership meeting night. I am Firefighter Brian Anderson, your curator and host for this evening. Tonight's membership meeting night is going to be an interview and a presentation from retired Deputy Chief Robert J. Marcasello, who's gonna be talking about his life as a fire buff, leading into his career as a firefighter with the Philadelphia Fire Department, and how he was a driving force behind the Philadelphia Fire Department's hazmat unit. He will also discover, he will also discuss how he was, what was the driving motivation behind his book, A Firefighter's Journal. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Deputy Chief Robert J. Marcasello. Chief, take it away. How you doing, everybody? Uh, before I get into the uh, book aspect of it, uh, what I wanted to do was a little presentation on the history of hazmat in the Philadelphia Fire Department. And as you can see by my PowerPoint uh, presentation, it should be up on your screen now, uh, you could see the parts of my career where I was uh, connected to hazmat, which up to the present day is between 35 and 40 years of hazmat experience. Uh, you can see on the first one, ladder 19 pre-hazmat. What I mean by that is before the phrase hazmat was really coined by the Philadelphia Fire Department, I was assigned to ladder 19. And I'll talk about that a little bit as we go along in the presentation. Uh, 
Then the rest of the time, you could say I was captain of the 60s. Before that, I was a backup uh, for to be in Battalion 1. I'll talk about, about that a little bit. And I served in the staff position at the Hazmat Administrative Unit, back out in the field, Battalion 1, Deputy 1, and with Delaware County's Hazmat Unit, where I've been since 2011. And as you're probably aware, that uh, I wrote a book called The Firefighter's Journal. I kept a journal for 37 years and eventually put it all into print. So let's get on with the presentation, at least to start it. Uh, the Berg explosion, I wanna talk about the Berg, I wanna talk about the Gulf Fire because these two major incidents in Philadelphia were driving forces for me to get to know pretty much in depth how to evaluate and assess the dangers imposed by a hazmat incident. And the Berg happened in 1954. And let's just review that incident and see uh, some of the things that happened there and how that might be a little bit different today. In January 54, of the Berg Laboratories, which was on uh, Fifth Street, North Philly, they were in the business of buying and selling chemicals. They would buy when the price was low and they would sell when the price is high, of course. Uh, to store those chemicals, they bought these two 4,000 gallon aluminum tanks, uh, 13 feet by, uh, I believe it was four feet. I can't see if it could, hold on a second here. 13 feet by nine feet. And uh, the tanks sat in the rear of the property. And the tanks actually came from a brewery and they were gonna just use these tanks to buy chemicals cheap, sell them a little bit higher. So in July of 54, they bought this chemical called Dow from Dow Chemical Company called Blend 4 number, number 421. And they bought it low and they sold it. And they sold it in August. So they drained the tank, cleaned them, probably not as good as they should have cleaned them. And then they refilled them with coconut oil, which is a fatty acid. A few months later, they sold off the coconut oil and they made some good money on the Dow Blend 421. So they bought more Dow Blend 421. And after cleaning, and draining the tanks, once again, not as good as they should have, they put the Dow Blend 421, which takes us to Thursday, October 28th, 1954. Uh, this day will live in infamy in the Philadelphia Fire Department. Uh, it was a major hazmat incident, once again, before the phrase was coined. And at six, six o'clock in the morning, Engine two, ladder three, and battalion six got a run to the Berg laboratories. Twos was commanded by Lieutenant Hayes Rommel. And I didn't know it at the time when I was addressed, when I actually worked with his daughter, because I remember her talking about how her dad was on this major incident in Philadelphia. Uh, Charlie Holtzman was in charge of ladder 19, and battalion six was Chief John News. This was the C platoon, they were dispatched for fumes. Something that I lobbied to change when I was in HMAU was rather unsuccessful, but I wanted to be dispatched as an odor investigation, but that never happened. Okay, when they get there, they find this heavy concentration in the area. Um, they said at times their vision was obscured. If you've ever been on the highway in a hot day and you see wavy lines seem to be emanating up from the surface of the highway, that's the, what they were saying by obscuring their vision. And the reports of the odors they got ranged all the way from ammonia-like to perfume-like, perfume which is a subjective nature of people trying to tell you what things smell like, you know, when you go at your dispatch of these types of incidents. This slide right here, this came from a 1955 edition of Fire Engineering, which uh, if you're familiar with Captain Timmy Tai, who retired from the Philadelphia Fire Department, but I worked the same time he did. He had this copy of this because his dad was on this job. And this is a plan view on the top of the Berg Laboratories. The front 
to the left is the Fifth Street side. And you can see the back is the yard between two buildings. And you can see two circles. One's highlighted in yellow. And the one highlighted in yellow is where this particular tank was that they were having the issue with. Uh, down the bottom is a view looking in the yard from the back side where the chain link fence was to the right. And what you could see an overhead garage door and some windows. And what actually happened here? Well, at 610, Chief News knew that he had something serious going on and he requests a box. And if you're familiar with the old timers in the fire department, requesting the box was not something that they took lightly. It was quite the opposite the way the fire service is today. They would feel that it was disgraceful upon them that they couldn't handle the incident, that they had to call for help. But Chief News, to his wisdom, seemed to know that he had something going on that was rather serious. So they hit the box for Germantown and Montgomery. You get engine 15, now out of service, right? 29s, 21s, now out of service. Ladder 7, now out of service. Battalion 3, which is Chief John McGrand. And they dispatched the deputy chief, Tom Klein, and rescue four on the incident. From 610 to 618, they're investigating to see what's happening. Uh, it reveals that the source of the vapors was coming from a vent at the top of the tanks. All right. Surprisingly, the yard itself is pretty clear because what had happened. The incident, instead of getting worse with, with time, seemed to be getting better with time. As they're in there and they're trying to figure out what's going on there, the odor, of fumes, the odor of fumes and stuff like that pretty much slowed down. So the yard is starting to clear up and they're starting to think, okay, we have this thing. It's not going to be that bad. And several firefighters actually go into the backyard, which you could see three sides were surrounded by walls and the rear by the chain link fence. And the firefighters under the yard, several of them, and you'll see from 29s, from twos, ladder three, the chiefs and everybody. What would we call that nowadays? We would call that the hot zone, right? And keep them out of there. But just the opposite, the way they thought back then, they were all in there looking around. So suddenly at 619, without any warning whatsoever, the tank blew up, boom. And they're all in this little confined area for lack of a better term. And you get this bluish liquid comes out from this big tank and these heavy vapors fill the area. And Chief News staggers around to the front of the building and with his dying breath, he asks for a second alarm. So he knew he had something seriously going on here. I mean, it just blew up in his face, All right? You can see the companies went on the second alarm. You can see 31s is out of service now, Battalion 4. But take note of the SS-100 and SS-101, because they're the forerunners of modern day hazmat. And we'll get to those slides a little bit later in the presentation. Amazingly, there was absolutely no fire in the yard. It was strictly a pressure explosion. I mean, take a soda can and shake it and shake it and shake it till the pressure blows, pushes it outward and then explodes. Well, this is what happened here, except on a grand scale. And what brought on that pressure is there was a reaction between the coconut oil and the Dow Blend 421. There's a front view of the uh, Berg Laboratories on 6th Street. Uh, this again came from that fire engineering uh, that Timmy gave me. You see some of the old paddy wagons that used to chase me through South Philly when I was a kid and some of the older apparatus out there. You still see ladders to every level, right? Something we do today. There's the remaining tank in the background. This is that plan view looking from the back where the chain link fence is. There's the remaining tank in the background. And you see these inspectors are looking at the pad on the bottom where the tank that blew up was situated. And not only were the tanks in here, look at all the 55 gallon drums and Lord knows how many of those things were destroyed and leaked stuff in this yard. 
that's what was remaining of the tank, the blue. All right, so the pressure in that yard, and you can see how it's confined by the three brick walls. So these poor firefighters got knocked around like ping pong balls. Their helmets were found on the roofs of some of the buildings. As a matter of fact, if you go to engine 29 nowadays, you could see some of their helmets still hanging on the walls as a remembrance to this incident. Killed in the line of duty, well, the deputy chief was killed, News was killed, McGran was killed, Charlie Holtzman was killed, Bandos, Doyle, Juno, Ty, Timmy Ty's dad was killed. Vivian was killed and Wilson was killed. So we had 10 line of duty deaths from this job. Some passed away immediately from the impact. Some lingered for days with a uh, sort of a pulmonary edema type of an issue. And I found this in another magazine or an old newspaper clippings in a fire brought, brought to the firehouse one night. And you can actually see the pictures of these guys who were killed. Uh, I mean, it, it, was all, it was a major tribute in one of the newspapers. There's Timmy's Ty's dad is right in the sun, so right in the middle. So if you know Timmy, you can see he's a spitting image of his father. And I do believe he has a son on the job now, but I'm not 100% certain of that. And a lot of these guys were World War II veterans. So they survived that and they got killed here at the Berg. There's some pictures of the funeral. There's Klein's funeral. That's uh, North Cedar Hill Cemetery. And there's uh, McGrand's funeral. Sorry about the qualities, but that's the best I could do when I copied off those, some of the uh, clippings that were offered to me. So no permits were issued to store these kind of stories chemicals. That's quite different today. Today, you have to get permits from the city. Uh, you have to pay uh, fees. Those fees nowadays come back and support the hazmat teams. Uh, there was no licenses, which is different today. And back then, no criminal charges were filed. Can you imagine today, right? Uh, this would be all over the paper and there would be culpability all over the place and the people would be in jail, but no criminal charges filed here. What was Dale Blind 421? Well, it was a mixture and it had some three pretty bad chemicals in there. Ethylene dichloride, propylene dichloride, and ortho dichlorobenzene. Uh, some of them in their own right are carcinogenic. Uh, most of them are toxic in one way, shape, or form but all bad chemicals. And what had happened and why the areas seem to be getting better than worse is as the pressure built up in a tank, it was venting out the top. But this Dow Blend 421 reacted with the coconut oil, which is a fatter, a more viscous material, thicker, and it clogged the vent on the roof. And that's why it slowed down. But inside the tank, the pressure just kept building up. And that's why you had this major explosion. There was a big question about whether phosgene was the killer of the firefighters. And a lot of debate, and I remember some of the old timers on the job telling me that's what killed the firefighters. But when I got into hazmat, I, I pretty much feel that that's not the issue. If you look at the, the mixture, and I put their chemical formulas on, I'm not trying to snow you with this stuff, but you can see the types of chemicals that are in here. There's a lot of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and chlorine. And you see the phosgene is carbon, oxygen, and chlorine, right? But to make the phosgene, you really have to synthesize it in a laboratory. And the process they use nowadays to make it is carbon tet and sulfuric acid. So in the bottom line, could some phosgene have been formed in this explosion? And I think the answer is yes. But was there enough phosgene to kill the firefighters? And I believe the answer to that is no. I think firefighters were killed, A, by the force of the explosion, and B, what happens when you have a major explosion, you stand there, you go, <gasps> you inhale like that. And what did they inhale when they did that? all the product that came out of it. And if you read the symptoms, 
pulmonary edema and stuff like that kind of lines up with having too much fluid in their lungs of basically halogenated hydrocarbons in their lungs. So what happened as a result of the Berg explosion? Some of you might know, but the Hero Scholarship Fund, because there was 10 firefighters and had tons of children left behind. And the next October, exactly a year after, is when they had the first Hero Scholarship show, the thrill show as we called it. All right, so much for the Burr Burr. And you can see why I really wanted to get into this to, for my own personal benefit to try and understand the things about the chemicals and why they cause so much harm. But we do things a lot differently nowadays. The Gulf Refinery Fire is the other one that piqued my curiosity. And the reason for that is I was there with Engine 24. Uh, it occurred August 17th, 1975, and it killed eight firefighters, whereas the Berg killed 10, the Gulf killed eight, six right away and two later. And I went with 24s, and it's one of the unique fires in uh, extra alarms in Philadelphia history because some companies went on both the first and later alarms. Uh, 24s was dispatched on the C platoon early that morning. Uh, we relieved them on the fire ground. And it was a lot of smoke coming from the tank, but it wasn't that much. Uh, and we went back, we ran from the station, but we came back on the seventh, right after a flash, after fighting a vacant blowing fire on, uh, I forget the name of the street. I have it in my book. You wanna read the street, read my book. Uh, but this job also greatly influenced my interest in hazardous materials because there's three things you need for a flammable liquid to burn. Uh, Vapor production, flammable concentration between the vapor and air, and an ignition source. And I always felt that if this incident, if the firefighters on scene understood these three parameters a little bit better, this incident might have been avoided. So while I was in the 60s, that's when I decided to shift the focus of our hazmat response to evaluating, making a better evaluation of a hazmat scene. There's some pictures, original pictures from my parents clipped out of the newspapers. It didn't look anything like this when we were there early in the morning, but when we came back on the seventh, this is what we were faced with. And all our three and a half was gone. We had a little bit of two and a half. Uh, we had to wing it pretty good and we still got it done. That's the south side of the building. You see Squirt 72. Uh, it, it was just one heck of a fire. Above you, you can see the uh, Platt Bridge, which is now the Penrose, it was the Penrose Avenue Bridge, which is now the Platt Bridge. And that's our Stang gun, which was a master stream device carried on 24s, sitting in the back of our station. There's 24 pumper, 24 pumper. And our little buff there, Luther, he's used to hang out in the station. So those two incidents, like I said, greatly influenced my own personal interest in hazmat. So when I go through the history of hazmat in the Philadelphia Fire Department, I'm going to break it down into four phases. BB, or free poor Bob, or Bob the Buff. When I was a little kid, I was a buff. Uh, I talk about that a little bit in my book, Chasing Fires Through South Philly as a Young Boy, and uh, really piqued my interest. I lived on Reed Street and Ladder 11 used to go out regularly and the factory across the street from my uh, apartment burned down and I watched that fire and was totally impressed. Uh, and then the phase two will be 73 to 88. Uh, before I was assigned to really to the hazmat unit and really started to take my hazmat interest into the job. And then 88 to 2010, where I was captain of 60s, battalion one and Chief HMAU and Deputy Chief Warner. And in 2010, I'm a buff again. I went right in full circle, so I'm right back around to where I was. So let's look at phase one before Bob, right? Going back to the early days in the fire department, they weren't handled by specialized units like they are nowadays. Uh, it was just one of the things that firefighters were expected to do. And, uh, I did some re research going back to the history of the fire department deaths, and you'd be surprised how many were killed back in the day by 
hazardous chemicals, in addition to being kicked by a horse and falling off the fire truck and all different kinds of things. But you would think, okay, well, we had chemical companies going back into the early uh, 1900s and the 1800s and the early 1900s, but the chemical, comp chemical companies weren't chemical companies for the purpose of handling hazmats. What they were is they were big soda acid extinguishers. And what many of you probably know this already, but their job was to, because it took so long to unplug a water main and plug into it, these big soda acid, uh, acid extinguishers got fast water on the fire. And if they could get it in the Scipion stage, they were knocking down the fire fast before the other companies got there and got in service. And the chemicals were kind of like this banded in 1928. And uh, this came from Jack Wright, uh, our beloved PFD historian who passed away uh, about a year ago, a year or two ago. Uh, chemical one's horses were John and Dick. They made the last run. And chemical three's horses were Dick and Buck. They made the last run. Still before me, you had the early rescue companies. So when the chemicals were disbanded, they realized around that time, they might have to get involved a little bit more with hazmat. So the rescue companies were given all different kinds of things and, and some of the stuff that they got, and they were around the, the before they were phased out the first time from 1926 to 1963. And they got a lot of stuff which included hazmat equipment. And there's a picture of one big old rescue truck. And I remember seeing these as a kid. Uh, this is Rescue One, which at one time I know was stationed at the Engine 17 station. And one of my fire instructors, Ray Bush, actually was assigned to Rescue One uh, when he was a firefighter. Uh, and when I was in the fire reserve, we got one of these as a civil defense vehicle. And it sat in the back of our firehouse. We were engine 81 back then, but in the back of our firehouse, which is engine 15's old station, we had one of these and it was painted, painted white and it had the big civil defense uh, symbols on it. But I was told it was one of the old rescues that had been disbanded from the fire department. Still before me, in the early 50s, the fire department had what they called the special services units. And I actually saw one of these in service uh, when I was a young buff, uh, SS-98. Uh, they brought it over to engine 10 and ladder 11 for an exercise. And what engine SS-98 was, just your typical air compressor uh, and jackhammers. And they were showing the firefighters how to use it. And uh, I guess it was our beginning of what do we do if we have a major building collapse? And I think a lot of our, the stuff that our task force does now, the PA task force one does, this was kind of like the beginning phases of that. We might have to jackhammer some things to get to people, okay? Uh, SS-99, which I don't have listed in here, was a giant deluge gun. I seen that in service as a kid and I actually was really close to it in the 1978 move fiasco. Uh, but then we had the SS-100 and SS-101. I talked about that a little bit earlier. And what was SS-100? It was a 49 auto car, 750 gallon per minute pumper, and they converted it into a foam unit. And it only had a 100 gallon foam tank. And if you know anything about using foam, we go through that really fast. Uh, 100 gallons of wetting agent, which kind of like breaks the surface tension of water and helps it to penetrate deeply into subsurface fires. They had some extra dry chemical extinguishers, some medical uh, metal X extinguishers, and carried additional foam and wetting agent in cans. And that was our earliest hazmat vehicle. And Jack actually got me a picture of that. And there's SS-100. And I don't know if you recognize that station, but that's Engine 31's old firehouse at 6th and Lehigh. That's where we used to keep uh, Robert Four, the old box watch vehicle, a little black Rambler. And SS-101, which kind of ran with that, was a 1950 Ford wagon. 
an old hose wagon was converted in a tender to a company that has this 100 on responses. I'm still a little foggy on who staffed these, if there was a special staff that were assigned to the SS units, or they were just handled by the manpower of the station. Uh, I never really did a clear answer on that. But the 101 carried more supplies of foam, wetting agents, metal extract powder, powder, and a smoke ejector, and mounted monitors, big mounted monitors to kind of like throw the foam far. And some of them also ran from the Meadows, Engine 69's firehouse. And there's SS 101. On the side, it's hard to read, but you could see where it says smoke ejectors on there. It says something about foams, it's something about smoke ejectors. And you see the giant monitors they have on the thing. So moving up a few more years later, SS 101 is redesignated as Chemical One. Yes. Redesignated Chemical One, and it carried the same equipment as SS 101, but they added an air cascade to it to refill the newly issued air packs, which were coming out in 54. And at that time, there was only one air pack per company. And probably in the very beginning, only the rescue was getting the air packs, or the rescues. They had up to four of them at one time. Uh, then they kind of liked that idea, and they said, well, SS-101, which is now Chemical One, really can't respond all over the city, so let's activate two more chemical companies. So Chemical Two and Chemical Three, which were pretty much the same equipment, and they were spaced throughout the city. So you had one basically in each division. In 64, now when they put the chemical companies together, they realized that the old chemical units, they were getting old and they were gonna replace them with uh, the soda trucks that we'll talk about later in the program. So they wanted to get a new faux pumper. So in 1964, they got car 512, which is a foam unit supplied by National Foam. And now you see it's a little bit bigger. You got a thousand gallon per minute pump and a thousand gallons of foam concentrate. And there's a picture of that thing and I'm not sure where that thing was, was housed. I'm really not sure where that picture was taken. It, it looks like somewhere in Old City, but I can't swear to that. You can see a giant foam nozzle on the top. And you can see two metal X extinguishers on the back. So we go into phase two now, you know, when I got on the job. All of that stuff was before I got on the job. So I'm assigned to ladder 19 which was responsible for staffing Chemical 3. And Chemical 3 was a 65 International House, and we called it the soda truck, because you'll see in the slide ahead, it looked just like a soda truck. Uh, it was one of the three chemical units in the city. And when I got there, we had the air cascade system for filling Scott bottles or SCBA bottles. It had a high X foam generator, foam cans, wet water, jet axes. That was the only thing that I really couldn't train on in the firehouse is the jet axes, they came in three different sizes and they were explosively charged devices designed to breach walls. And they came in small, medium, or large. And you really was no way to practice with, with this thing. You just had to hope it worked when the time came to use it. And I heard they were used once or twice in the history of the fire department, but I never used it. Uh, it had a, a cord on it. You pulled the cord out and you had to hit the, the button to set the thing off. You had to make sure you were sheltered before you did that. So you had those things. You had the watering devices, confined space air packs, junk from the old rescues, and two chemical suits rolled up in a ball. Uh, and they had these little peephole to look out of. So if you don't line the suit up, you couldn't see anything. And they also had plenty of Vaseline in the truck. Now, what was the Vaseline for? They told me as a fireman, says, if you ever go to a chlorine le a leak or a ammonia leak, get these jars of Vaseline and put all the Vaseline under your armpits and under your groin, and you'll be fine. Now, I'm glad I never had to do that either. And there's ladder 19, what it looked like when I got there. It's 
actually the first apparatus I drove was 68 Seagraves. We had a scaling ladder on that truck, a life net, which is in the foremost compartment of the tiller section, the trailer section. And there is the soda truck. You see why we called it the soda truck. Because I mean, if it didn't say Philadelphia Fire Department, Chemical Unit 3, but it said Coca-Cola on it, it would look like it's delivering Coca-Cola. And there's one that, that Jack got me with all the guts taken out of it. And you can see in the uh, top of the center compartment, the heaviest thing we had was in the top of the center compartment, probably because the only compartment to hold it was the high X generator. And that thing was uh, really hard to get in service. Uh, There's like a, a bunch of steps to it, and you couldn't get any of the steps wrong, you wouldn't flow foam. But below that, you could see the old air cascade system for filling Scott bottles. And it basically had five bottles and two spares. And most of the runs for these chemical units were to fill bottles for fires elsewhere, either Center City, South Philly, West Philly, Southwest Philly. So the chemicals, especially, especially back then, it was the warriors, we were running a lot, you know, and they would always juxtapose the watch list and everything else and got people all pissed off, and whatever. But you can see a little box there that says C3 on the bottom. What you would do is you would hang that by the cascade unit and then the firefighters would take the bottles off their packs, you would lay them in air and then you could fill them it would hold to support the bottle so you could fill them. To the right of that box with the C3, you'll see some watering devices. We carried an extra K12 saw in there. <coughs> you see in the back, there's foam cans. And unfortunately for the driver, sitting right behind the driver's seat in the first compartment on the other side was the jet axis. And right next to them was these old chemical suits that fortunately I never got to use either. So I assigned the ladder 19, engine 60 was a two-piece company. As you know, uh, phased out, I believe in 73 or 74. Uh, it was from the old horse-drawn days. I mean, even before that, whereas you had a big steamer would be the pumper and a hose wagon carried the hose because the big steamer didn't have room for hose. So in the old days, in the horse-driven days, you had a pumper and a hose wagon. Well, that tradition was still around when I got in the fire department. We still had the two-piece companies. And there was several companies who were two pieces and they had uh, they were all high pressure companies. That means they could work with the high pressure system. And uh, the first piece was the wagon and the second piece was the pump. And the wagon would go right to the fire and the pumper would take a hydrant. It was kind of like the tactics, but try that in the uh, streets of South Philadelphia. It was really tough. So, I mean, on a box, you could conceivably wind up with eight different pumpers and two ladders, which really jams up the streets. Uh, but for Engine 60, their second piece doubled also as the city's phone pumper. So in every run that Engine 60 had when I went there, they took the phone pumper with it as the pumper. And engine 60, 74 to the war of France was the wagon, went right to the fire. And Uncle Frank was one of the firefighters that broke me in. He taught me how to operate and drive both the chemical unit and engine 160. But engine 160 was destroyed at the Gulf Fire, along with the engine 133, uh, engine 40, and engine 16. Uh, my buddy, Bobby Lombardo, uh, who worked with me at Ladder 19 and uh, 24s. I used to break the stones every once in a while because I used to say, he was like a lieutenant that day of Engine 16. I says, you're one of the few officers in this job that ever lost a pump to a fire. Yes, the second piece that was running with Engine 60 back in the day now. In the streets of South Philadelphia, getting that thing around was a real royal pain. It had six it had to, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it didn't have, it didn't have enough riding room for it just the driver and somebody to ring the bell or the siren operator on the other side. A lot of times the 100 series pumpers were stayed behind on extra alarms and we'd call people in to staff them. So this is one of the few last pieces in the city that if it got staffed on an extra alarm,
Are we okay, gang? Yeah, you cut out for a minute, but it looks like you're back on. Is the screen set up the way? No, you'll have to go back to your slides. Okay, let me. Uh... How's that? Uh, we don't see them yet. Did you do the share screen from inside Zoom? All right, everybody, just hold on a minute while we fix the technical difficulties we're experiencing right now. Okay, so is this problem on my end? Yeah, it might have you might have had a problem with your internet. It might have might have got bad reception. So just uh, just open up the uh, yeah. You're sharing your screen now. There you go. You're right back in the game. Okay. So I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm there talking to myself. <laughs> okay. All right. So we talked about the foam unit engine one sexy. Let's move on to the the next slide. For some reason. My PowerPoint's not going, here we go. There's a, we're still in phase two, which when I left Ladder 19, I went to 24s and that was our apparatus back then at 72 Ward de France. Probably seen a pretty similar pumper like that on the show emergency. Uh, so what had happened is the Gulf refinery replaced the apparatus destroyed at the Gulf Fire, the three, with three 1976 international foam pumpers. These were also thousand gallon per minute with 300 gallon water tanks and 700 gallon foam tanks. And it was a folk protein based foam, which was the old organic foam that really stunk odor wise. And there's a picture of engine 160 uh, at the old firehouse on 24th street. You can see it had six discharges, a giant foam nozzle on the top, and here's a picture of it in service at the refineries. You see the, in front of it, the old Arco refinery this was, that's a foam tanker. And this must've been a heck of an incident because the foam tanker probably ran out of foam at this time, or the foam tanker was busy supplying their own vehicles. Uh, but it was very labor, labor intensive. We had to get the five gallon fan, cans off the chemical units or off of pallets that were delivered by national phone and manually dumped them into the tank on the top of the phone bumper. <clears throat> so moving on with the whole hazmat concept in 1978, when I was at 43s, department under the direction of the, who I call the grand sensei, Harry Cusick, was a battalion chief, the first chief of the hazmat administrative unit. Uh, they established three hazardous chemical task force and each one ran with their engine, ladder, a 76 foam pumper and one of the old soda truck chemical units. And they also assigned a battalion chief to each task force. And where were they? Well, there they were, the three divisions, yeah, 60s, ladder 19, engine 19, ladder eight and seven, ladder 10. And at the time, only uh, Chemical 3 I was assigned the chlorine capping kits because they only had one set of chlorine capping kits. In 1982, I'm back at 24s, and the department realized at that time that having three hazmat task forces wasn't cost efficient, and the one up in 19s really wasn't doing much. So they decided to disband the one and when they ordered new chemical units to replace the soda trucks, and these were 1982 Ford Salisbury's, but they only ordered two. And they had positive displacement foam pumps that could feed the foam pumpers. And 
They also carried a thousand gallons of synthetic foam, which didn't stink, thousand pounds per thousand pounds of purple K and an air supply system. And I'll show you that in a second with uh, one of the pictures of it. And there's one that one of the 82 Salisbury's that we got. Uh, you see up top, this is when we acquired this thing to go with as part of hazmat task force. Uh, we had to carry our junk all over the place, see recovery drums up front. But in the compartment closest to the driver, right behind the driver, you see that big red tank? That's the Purple K unit and the hose reels on that uh, would discharge Purple K. Behind that was an air cascade system. And then we had our suits and everything else. So the hazmat was starting to get a little bit more upgraded, but we're now down to two hazmat units, one at sevens and one at sixties, all right? Uh, and now that the, they ordered those two, they still had three foam pumpers. So the one that was at 19s, they moved it to 44s because of recent fire that they had on the Schuylkill Expressway that really almost destroyed the overpass under 30th Street Station. And Hazmat 1 or Hazmat Task Force 1 was in South Philly and Hazmat Task Force 2 was in North Philly or Northeast Philly almost for lack of a better term, and engine seven. And 85 was when I first got qualified. So we're into the phase here where I just start to get into hazmat a little bit. And the reason for that is uh, captains in the department need to be qualified as acting battalion chiefs. And since I was in the first battalion at 49s, my chief wanted me to be extremely familiar with the hazmat unit. So I had to get qualified it was as the hazmat, as a hazmat acting battalion chief. So whenever one of the officers at engine 60 or ladder 19, <coughs> excuse me, was off, I would get detailed over there in addition to my duties of 49s. And I did my three years of 49. I was extremely happy about it. I got transferred to 65s. I was back in West Philly, back in the fire belt. And not that long after that, I got detailed, oh, transferred back to engine 60. Matter of fact, three months later. So now I was officially part of the fire department's hazmat response program and we enter phase three. And the new stuff, when I got back there, uh, assigned there, uh, we had level A suits, we had orange suits, which were made of butyl rubber and green suits, which were Viton rubber. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had a reference library. And in that reference library was what first tipped my head that something needed to be done here. Because we had a book of all these different chemicals and some were highlighted, highlighted orange and some were highlighted green. Well, if it was highlighted orange, you use the orange suit. If it was highlighted green, you use the green suit. And the first question I asked, I said, I suppose it's not highlighted at all. <laughs> and they said, geez, we don't know what to do. So I knew we had, a, we had some work cut out for us when I got there, but they were very well trained. They really were. Uh, we had air supply system, communication system for inside the suits. And at this time, there was still no rescue unit brought back. So we had a lot of the stuff that would eventually go to the rescue units. We had a caldo torch, was a cutting torch. Uh, uh, the updated confined entry harnesses. We had a 300 foot high rise air rail supply, which we actually put in service at the Meridian. And I used it a couple other times at other fires. As a matter of fact, at the Meridian, uh, some of our lines got damaged by falling debris. <clears throat> and non-sparking tools, we had a, one of the original, what most people call four gas monitors nowadays. Uh, the department didn't buy it. It was actually donated to us, but that worked really well until one of my platoons drew liquid into it, and that was the end of that. And we had an MSA uh, tube kit, a colorometric tube kit, and, that was repossessed in the middle of the night by the uh, distributor who was loaning it to us and, and we never bought it. So he came out in the middle of the night and took it back. And both units had the chlorine kits A, B, and C. So the city was kind of like fine with the two hazmat units until the state got involved right after the Superfund Amendment and Reauthorization Act. And the state passed Pennsylvania Act 165, which mirrored that thing. 
And what it stipulated was that each county must have at least one hazmat response team, must either provide or contract the services of. And with that, there was a lot of things that needed to be bought, physicals, personnel issues, and other things like that, that was going to be heavily burdensome to the city as far as costs were concerned. So uh, the city at that point decided that we got to go to one unit. We can't afford to do this to both units. So we're going to cut it back down to one. And the rumor at the time, and remember again, this is before Rescue One came in business, is that we were going to go to 29s and we're going to take volunteers or if we had to do a lottery or whatever, we were going to pull from engine 60, ladder 19, engine seven, ladder 10. And those members will be transferred to 29s slash hazmat one or whether they were going to put ladder service, level ladder seven back of service, I'm not sure, but it never happened because right after that concept was being kicked around, they decided to go to the rescue unit. <clears throat> and the city was forced now at making a decision. Are we going to keep hazmat one, which is isolated in South Philly, or are we going to keep hazmat two, which is more centrally located, engine seven? And it's a long story, but they kept us, Engine 60. And we uh, took their chemical unit and we got rid of, rid of our foam pumper. So now we had Engine 60 and the two chemical units would respond together as Hazmat 1. As a matter of fact, I start coining that designation when we go on radio. I, I didn't feel like saying Hazmat TS Force 1. So I just said Hazmat 1 and it kind of caught on. <clears throat> And I'm proud to say, you know, and I had really good officers down there, including Tommy Bitto. And we were the first ones in the state to be certified as a hazmat response team. And Chief Jerry Janda, I mean, he did a lot to really get us, get us over this hump. Uh, procured equipment, uh, begged, borrowed, stole. And uh, we finally, you know, got certified. And like I said, the first one and Tommy Pitto providing a well-catered dinner really, really helped push it over the edge. Uh, 1995, Chief Whalen was now the chief of the uh, Hasban Administrative Unit, and he caught wind that Sun Refinery was penalized for an environmental issue, and they were forced to provide the city with a $200,000 grant, and they were going to redo Bartram Gardens or something like that. And uh, Jimmy went to a couple of meetings. He says, what do you want to do? We'll build a swamp. He says, I really need a hazmat vehicle. And as a result of that, uh, myself, Jimmy, uh, George Yeager uh, went around. We start looking at different units out there. And we, we settled on a uh, 1996 duplex Salisbury with an air cascade system, command center, plenty of storage. It was almost mislabeled hazmat tones. Yeah. And when they said, what do you want on the side? I said, hazmat one. And I was thinking at the end, hazmat one, number one. And uh, when I went out for the pre, one of the pre-delivery inspections, I said, it looks like a doo-wop group, the hazmat tones. So they had to redo it a little bit. Uh, we had a coffin compartments up top and I told them to make it wide enough that we could store recovery drums between them. But to get those recovery drums up there, I decided in the back of that truck, we needed a set of stairs going up. So they kind of like built that into the vehicle and uh, they called the Bob Step because it started to catch on around country. You know, when you're looking at different apparatus and you're going around, they show you what other people have bought. And a lot of people were seeing that and they liked the idea. So what did we run with back then? We ran with the engine, hazmat one. And since we had more junk than hazmat one can hold, we kept one of the chemical units. In this case, chemical one was in the better shape. It was these, it's delivered in the December 96 and Tommy Bitto and myself were the trainers for four for platoons. And unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you want to look at it, I never got to make a run on my truck because I got promoted battalion chief. But this is a picture of the uh, big box truck, which has since then been replaced. 
and, and that's basically what is a big box truck. You can see behind the driver, there's a, a crew cab and there's also a research area that we built a new truck. And when I made chief, they transferred me to Hazmat Administrative Unit. And that's where we put together our own in-house training programs. It was four weeks long and uh, that led to pro board certification. So you can see Hazmat one here was really starting to move along. And uh, after uh, three years, four months, 21 days, I got transferred back to the field. I got battalion one, which was also Hazmat. And we all know what happened in 2001 and uh, September 11th. Uh, 2000, September 11th. The 2001, September 11th, uh, shortly after those attacks, uh, we had a meeting. It was uh, myself, Chief Rosini, Joe Mack, Freddie Undercutt, Tommy Bitto, uh, a lot of the special ops pe people. And we saw how New York's special ops was decimated. And we were asked, what would we like to see in Philadelphia? So we asked for another hazmat unit bring back sevens, another rescue unit, and five squad companies. Well, we got two squad companies, but that worked out because what the two squad companies did, they could double as a second hazmat team. And we made sure when we trained them, they were totally certified to act as an independent team. And they could also act as a second rescue unit. And the concept has really worked out well for us. So when those Pieces finally went in, per in service in 2004 American LaFrance pumpers, 1500 GPM at this time. Uh, and they also ran with the freight liners we called bread trucks. And squad 47 and 72 and combined met the requirements for a second state certified hazmat team. And this is what 47s looked like. They've since then been replaced, I, I understand. Uh, but I'm sure they might have kept them in reserve for, I'm not sure, as squads or whatever. And there's the old bread truck, which isn't far removed from what we have at the county now. Uh, and I call it the bread truck because you, know, you put Amoroso on the side of that thing and it could deliver rolls and loaves of bread. And as a matter of fact, when I was deputy one and they would get a run, I would yell out there, hey, they, need, they need loaves of bread out in West Philly and they would all laugh. So uh, going back to the foam pumpers in 2001, farmers was a little disappointed in the maintenance and the condition of the 76 internationals. So, you know, I met with Chief McCrory and we decided to go with frontline foam pumpers to the added to the fleet. And in other words, instead of just something that was gonna sit there and hardly ever get used, we were gonna spend a little bit extra to make them frontline pumpers and use them all the time. And that way, the, the operators would be a little bit more familiar with how to get these things in service. Because uh, we had some issues with some of the older foam bumpers, uh, the internationals. So we signed, uh, the, we lobbied to have one transfer back to Hazmat for vapor suppression. And, and Tommy Bitto was our basically our department's foam expert, and he did a lot of the training with these things. And I believe that pumper is still around today. Uh, there's a foam 60, and uh, I believe I heard rumors that that's either in the works, in the pipeline, or is about to happen, but that's close to being replaced. In 2006, uh, Chief McGraw was chief to HMAU, and he got a hold of some monies, and uh, we had a little meeting, and he decided, you know, it would be nice to get all the stuff out of the research area of Hazmat One and built a truck that was pretty much dedicated to that purpose. And that was Hazmat Two, it was a 2006 Freightliner. It was a mobile lab, it had a micro microscope, workstations, uh, plenty of storage and outlets to charge our meters and stuff like that. It even has a glove box on the outside where it's they could carry contaminated containers, open a door from the outside of the truck, put it into the truck and close it. And then the truck, and it's in an enclosed box, we actually put your hands in the gloves, like a bio level safety four thing, and manipulate and do whatever things you have to do to determine what it is. 
and I had a foot a fume hood for chemical analysis. And that's still in service today, and it's running with 60s. Uh, they named it Hazmat 2. And shortly after that, the 82 chemical units were declared dead. I mean, we really got a lot of years out of those things, but they were really starting to fall apart. So uh, the department wanted to maintain our foam and purple K capabilities. So what we did was we purchased a unit that we call Chemical One. So long live John and Dick, the old horses, right? They're back. And it was a 2007 Ford F500 slash Seagrave Purple K response, response unit. This one, I didn't think we really needed it, but but we got it and it's still now, it, it runs and it's, it runs with the hazmat task force. And then we wanted to be able to get more foam to a scene. So we got a 2007 Seagrave foam tender. This is a purple K unit that currently runs with hazmat one. See, it has two rails on the top. And once again, that's, that's not from a booster tank. That's from the purple K tank that sits inside those compart that big compartment in the center. And it gives them a lot of room to carry a lot of other, other stuff. And, you know, when you're in this hazmat business, you run out of thing, you run out of places fast. I mean, in, in the county, we have a big response truck and a trailer, and we still don't have room for everything we want to carry. And there's the foam dump tender. This, I believe, is still running out of engine 33, although this picture was taken, it looks like uh, at 18 station. That's the, the Roosevelt Boulevard behind it. And I believe that's got 3,000 gallons of foam, which is a lot better than anything we've ever had. So Chief McGraw did a really nice job with this thing. Uh, and 2016, after I retired, so now we're talking to phase four, uh, Hazmat One was officially 20 years old and it was time for replacement. And uh, what they got, I was now out of the loop, but they got... Uh, a new hazmat one this is a 2016 Freightliner, a big box style, similar to old hazmat one, no bob steps in the back. Uh, they added a robot for recon entry along with the big crane to get it on and off the truck. And it was the first Philadelphia Fire Department apparatus to have names of firefighters on the truck. And uh, the two firefighters that they put on there were Captains Tommy Bitto and Jimmy McGarrigle. And I worked with both of these guys at Hazmat One. Jimmy worked across the floor in Ladder 19 and was an ace, you know, and spent even more time at Hazmat than I did. And Tommy Bitto was known throughout the department as Mr. Hazmat. And uh, I, I couldn't have been more proud to see their names on, on that new vehicle. <clears throat> and that's the new truck that they have down there today. And you see on the front, it still says Hazmat 1, but they uh, made an, a nice big separator between Hazmat and ONA so it don't look like Hazmatone. And they did the same thing on this side where they put the one underneath. So they're not the rolling doo-wop group that we were in the uh, 90s. There's a picture from the back with the crane. They could get their robot on and off. And today, where am I at with Hazmat? Where I am, there I am in the county with uh, my own bread truck. You know, we deliver rolls throughout the county of Delaware, or whatever they call for them. It's a 2012 12 LDV bread van. And I'm still out there doing it. And what else did I do since I retired? Well, I had kept a journal the whole time of my career. And uh, kind of crazy, but a little bit of OCD here and there. And uh, there was things in my journal that I didn't want uh, other people to see. So I started to track, they extract some of the stories out of journal and type them down uh, just so uh, my descendants, for lack of a better term, could read about some of the things that I did and, uh, and witnessed without reading some of the things I didn't want them to read. And when my son saw it, he said, Dad, you ought to write a book. And I said, wow, that's a lot of work. And I, at that time, I think I had 20 stories I extracted out of the journal. And I started to 
pieced them all together. I laid it out and I said, okay, I need something here, here, here. It covers this years and five years later and an awful lot of work. And I published a book in December of 2017. And I was really under the gun because I wanted it out before Christmas. Uh, and I did, published it on December 17th. And uh, I believe it was December. I forget the exact date, but it was on a Friday. And two days later, Matt Letourneau, who doesn't live far from where I live now in Springfield, who didn't live far from where I live in Springfield, he called me up and said, I bought your book and I already read it. He said, and I want to be the first one to have my book signed. And this was a picture taken by Matt when he came over to my house and I signed his book. And it was less than a month later when Matt lost his life in line of duty. Uh, special thanks for this presentation to uh, Jack Wright uh, for the pictures uh, that he gave me. I mean, when I was putting this together, anything I asked for Jack, and even when I was writing the book, I mean, him and Jackie Oswald, uh, tremendous help, because uh, some of the things were a little foggy in my journal. Uh, I used to love it when the, the two Jacks would come to the firehouses that I worked, uh, uh, down to Battalion One, when I was at the Deputy One, and they would spend the nights with us. And just one funny story with uh, Jackie Oswald is, um, I was on eBay and every once in a while I would just hit Philadelphia Fire and see if anything interesting came up. And I saw this 1955 platoon working schedule, which was interesting because they worked every day. There was three shifts and they were eight hour shifts and you're only off if your group day was off. And I start bidding on this thing. And each time I bid, I got outbid. I said, who is this kook? And I lost it. I eventually lost it. And a couple of nights later, the two Jacks came over to the firehouse. I said, Jack, I said, you would have loved it. I said, I was bidding on a 55 platoon works together. He says, that was you? He says, I finally won it. So we could have paid a lot less for the thing if we hadn't been competing against each other. But that's kind of like where it's at. Uh, Brian, I could turn it back over to you, or where do you want to go from here? Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh Appreciate it. great presentation. Um, uh, but right now, we'll take any questions. If anybody has any questions that they would like to uh, to ask, in the meantime, I want to thank you, Chief, for. Uh, joining us tonight and giving us brief, this great presentation. I've also read your book and was just blown away. Uh, uh, we got one question here. It says, can you share a funny story of life in the firehouse? <laughs> I'm trying to think of one where it doesn't get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of good ones in the book. Uh, I'll have to think about that one for a minute because I don't want to get myself or anybody else in trouble. And uh, we have another question here from Don Kramer. What was some of your most memorable runs with Hazmat? Uh, Hazmat would have to be my, my one of my first calls uh, where I actually went into suits even though the supervisors weren't supposed to. And I got to uh, feel firsthand what it's like to be in those things. And uh, it, it was hot, humid, 90 plus day and sweating like crazy and uh, damn near passed out inside the suit. And uh, that's my most memorable. What, there was a lot of them that fighting a couple of uh, VAT fires. Uh, VAT fires are something that we used to read in the textbooks, but I had never seen done in Philadelphia until I was in Hazmat. And open VATs were used in manufacturing, and they had high flashpoint flammable liquids. And 
you could actually put these things out using uh, the old fog adapters, these, these big long adapters on a hook. And uh, we did that a couple of times and that was pretty impressive and pretty memorable. Uh, there was a ton of stuff that went on with the uh, suspicious anthrax letters in 2001. Uh, we were doing uh, upwards maybe 20 hazmat calls a day. And I guess something that we we had to do is that Chief Rosini was a big part of this as we put rapid assessment teams. I mean, the hazmat unit was getting called all over the city going from one to the other. So we put these rapid assessment teams in service and each rapid assessment team would have a hazmat officer, a hazmat firefighter, and the guys loved it because they're killing the overtime. They would have a police officer for evidentiary material and we'd have somebody with the health department. And when they were dispatched, they were dispatched as rat one, rat two, rat three, and we had, we had up to seven of them at a time. Yeah, there was a lot of funny calls on that stuff. I mean, uh, the people were just panicking over different things. I mean, I had a lawyer eating powdered donuts, opening and reading his mail, and saw the white powder on his pants and thought it was anthrax. And, you know, we went up there and I see the box of donuts behind the guy. <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, I remember those days. Uh, another question we have here from Michael Natali from second alarmers is in the event that engine 60 and ladder 19 is out on a run already is there a backup for the hazmat team nowadays yes because nowadays we have the two squad companies and the two squad companies could be married and dispatch those hazmat unit I mean, send 72s and 47s together and they can function independently as a state certified hazmat team now, with that in mind, there's plenty of times they would try to get us off the fire ground to send us to the hazmat. As a matter of fact, one of my uh, most vivid memories was going on a box alarm being second in engine and ladder 19 first in ladder. And as we're responding, we see smoke and we're told to disregard. And here they were dispatching us as a hazmat. That pissed mm. everybody off on the back step, but it's came with the territory. It's just something you had to do. Well, I know uh, under Commissioner Teal's administration, uh, he was trying to separate hazmat and let engine 60 and ladder 19 run as an engine and ladder and have the hazmat team strictly as a hazmat team. Now, that was a couple of years ago. I'm not sure where they are in that process, but... Uh, you know, that's, uh, that was some of the things they're working on. Um, for those uh, young viewers that may be on tonight that are inspiring to be firefighters, what would you say um, was the hardest transition from uh, firefighter officer? And, and if, if, you, if, if you were talking to a young version of yourself now with your experience, what would you say how to handle that transition from firefighter becoming an officer? Uh, I, I guess it's a, a matter of having self-confidence that you didn't get to be an officer unless you proved yourself worthy of becoming an officer. And it's a big jump to be one of the guys, for lack of a better term, in the kitchen of the firehouse to be in the leader. Because now everything that comes down the pike, see the lieutenant, see the lieutenant, see the lieutenant, see the lieutenant. So that part of it administratively is a big jump. And uh, on the fire ground, you're, you're going to be making the calls. You're going to make uh, a lot of calls until the chief gets there and stuff like that. So the biggest transition, I think, for me is from firefighter to lieutenant. The second biggest transition is from captain to battalion chief. Uh, it's just, you know, going from captain where you're with a company of three or four firefighters, and all of a sudden, it's just you with a hand light and a radio, and you're directing a bunch of companies. It's, it's a bigger transition. But 
before the overtime, we had plenty of uh, acting experience as battalion chiefs, and that that really helped. When I got promoted, I felt like I was ready, and all I really had to do was polish my act and get better at it. You know, but I had been a captain for uh, twelve years too before I made battalion chief. Well, again, I want to thank you for this great presentation. I want to thank all my viewers that tuned in with us tonight. And uh, if you're not a member and you're watching this, please join our membership. You can either do that by going to our website online or coming down to the museum. And if you like content like this, please leave a comment and we hope to see you. You can see all our content, our membership meeting nights and our curator's corner on our YouTube page. It's Fireman's Hall Museum channel at YouTube. So and tell them you got the books available there. At the, and the I'm sorry, the books, Firefighters Journal are available in the museum. And you can also get them on Amazon. Yes. And for those of you that would like to donate, here is our information and all our social media platforms on the screen for you right now. Again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And we hope to see you again in March. Thank you. Thank everybody. Thank you, Chief. Everyone have a good night. You too.